all problems begin with the patient. All problems end with the patient. And everything else that we have, the research, the wonderful hospitals, and the whole medical industrial complex exists to help a patient. And so it's always important for me to keep a patient in mind, and I have chosen this particular patient to talk about. This patient is not the typical patient with focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, but because this patient uh, is typical of those who have tremendous problems with FSGS, I've chosen this patient. Now, on examination of a child who presents to us with nephrotic syndrome, we see the findings that uh, have already been talked about by Dr. Conley. Normal blood pressure, puffiness, and please note that this child has asthma. And this is one of the clues that may help us one day understand what focal sclerosis and minimal change are all about because there are so many of these patients who have asthma or whose family members have asthma. And there is a concomitant increase in the prevalence of asthma in industrialized societies, even as we are seeing more cases of FSGS. And I like to think in a very simplistic way that um, asthma, that nephrotic syndrome is the asthma of the, um, of the kidney. And the laboratory studies, uh, some people will do millions of laboratory studies, and I like to save money and do very few laboratory studies because there are very few laboratory studies that are really needed in order to help us manage the patients. The proteinuria, the normal creatinine, the low albumin, and the elevated cholesterol, which we see. Now, the uh, child who comes in with puffiness, we think of as nephrotic syndrome if we're nephrologists, uh, because if you're a carpenter and you carry a hammer, then everything you see is a nail. So if you're a nephrologist and you see puffiness, then everything is nephrotic syndrome. But most patients with nephrotic syndrome are first diagnosed by their pediatricians as allergies, and often the diagnosis is delayed. The first thing we think about is minimal change. We have to think about transient proteinuria because in some people, fortunate enough, there is proteinuria which then disappears. In adolescents, there may be proteinuria that is a benign as a result of um, posture. And then this fourth condition, which I think is increasing in prevalence, mesangial proliferative glomerular nephritis, can present exactly like minimal change nephrotic syndrome. I'll talk a little bit about it later. And then this number five is the one diagnosis that I hate making in any patient that I ever see. And I hate having to tell a family or a patient that the diagnosis is FSGS because of its implications and ramifications. Membranous nephropathy can present like nephrotic syndrome and so can membranoproliferative, but they are fortunately less common. And then there is an increasing number of inherited causes of nephrotic syndrome. And Dr. Holtzman will talk about this, but this is where the greatest advances have been made in recent years in our understanding of nephrotic syndrome. Now, in this little boy, the most likely diagnosis was minimal change or steroid-sensitive nephrotic syndrome. And um, this condition of uh, minimal change nephrotic syndrome uh, really taxes the resources of the doctor. And um, this is because, uh, as in all chronic diseases of childhood, the child has been robbed of his or her normal future. And there is an uncertain future. And the medications, as good as they are, have toxic uh, side effects. And uh, we are finding that many people have conflated the terms steroids, as in football, steroids with corticosteroids. And of course, there is this ever-present fear that the child 
may need a renal transplant or may even die. Uh, in the 42 years since I have seen my first case of nephrotic syndrome, I have seen one child die from minimal change nephrotic syndrome. Um, and I'll, I will say later today why that child died. Now, the term minimal change nephrotic syndrome is a really silly term. It's the best we have. And it's based on the fact that there are no real changes that we can see on light microscopy. This is the, on top is the biopsy specimen from Cedric, not his real name. And here is the biopsy specimen from a person who was biopsied and had normal, um, a normal um, glomerulus, completely normal glomerulus. Does anyone want to comment on the two biopsies? Anyone want to say anything? The what? Well, that's just a staining artifact. I beg your pardon? No, that's just a sampling error because the glomeruli are not distributed evenly. That is a fixation artifact. It has no meaning. They are very similar, but they, hello? Dr. Pradhan, do you know what the difference is? The glomeruli at the top are larger than the glomeruli at the bottom. This is the patient that I'm talking about. This is a person with normal glomeruli at the same age. This patient's glomeruli are larger. And on um, the uh, electron microscopy, what happens to the foot processes is they become effaced. They're amazing, amazing organelle. Dr. Holtzman will talk about it. They can open and they can close. And in nephrotic syndrome, they become effaced. And uh, that means that with treatment, they can open up again. Now, we talk about minimal change in nephrotic syndrome. We don't really know what we're talking about. And an attempt has been made to talk about corticosteroid-sensitive, corticosteroid-responsive nephrotic syndrome because people who respond to corticosteroids, generally speaking, have minimal change in nephrotic syndrome and don't need kidney biopsies. And that's why in the modern era, Few children under about 12 or 14 years of age have kidney biopsies uh, because most of them will respond if they have the minimal change. So we talk about cortico corticosteroid responsive. We talk about frequently relapsing. We talk about corticosteroid depending nef dependent nephrotic syndrome, which can still be minimal change, but may be early focal sclerosis, but not necessarily and we talk about corticosteroid-resistant nephrotic syndrome, which can still be minimal change, but may be focal sclerosis. It can still be minimal change. And one of Dr. Siegel's uh, contributions to our knowledge was that many years ago, he wrote a paper in which he showed that patients with corticosteroid-resistant could be converted to responsive with cyclophosphamide and still have minimal change. Now, not only do we seem to be seeing an increase in the number of patients with minimal change who are difficult, and an increase in the number of focal sclerosis patients in the population, but two studies have now shown that more patients than we used to believe will have relapses in adulthood. And that seems to be a change in the epidemiology and the outcome of the disease. And the predictors of relapse in adulthood would be young age at onset, more severe disease in childhood. Now, many patients will come to us with um, what looks like minimal change, and they'll have blood in the urine, we'll biopsy them, and they will have this mesangial proliferative form of glomerulonephritis, also uh, known under those names. And this is still a very confusing group. But this is a group of patients who is at greatest risk for progression to focal sclerosis. Uh, 
then minimal change is at risk for progression to focal sclerosis. And these patients are more likely to have hematuria, blood in the urine, high blood pressure, and to be resistant to, um, to uh, corticosteroids. Now, our patient, Cedric, did not respond to uh, prednisone in the usual doses for the usual course that we'll talk about. And he had his first biopsy, which showed large glomeruli, which I showed you before. And then we thought, gee, he's a strange case of minimal change, not responding. So we then gave him treatment, which we'll talk about later, to which he did not respond. And he subsequently had another biopsy, which shows this area of focal sclerosis. I think the single most... Um, depressing finding we can find on biopsy in children with kidney disease. Now, we must pay attention not just to the, um, the scar over here, but to this tissue around the scar. And somebody asked the question about the tubules. And the tubules play an extremely important role uh, in a nephrotic syndrome because the tubules reabsorb filtered protein. And the amount of protein that we see in the urine is not the amount of protein that's filtered by the tubules. A great deal of the protein is reabsorbed. And um, we know from many, many studies in animals that depending on the type of protein that's being reabsorbed by the tubules, and we don't know everything about this yet, that this protein may actually begin to damage the tubules and the spaces between the tubules called the interstitium. And in many, many cases, the outcome of treatment and the outcome of the disease depends as much and often more on what is happening here in the tubular interstitial component of the kidney as in the glomeruli. The glomeruli are necessary in terms of the disease occurring. The tubules and the interstitium have the secondary hits. Here you can see part of a glomerulus that's been co completely sclerosed. And there you can see that around that glomerulus, the interstitium is beginning to sclerose and stifle the glomerulus. So focal glomerulus, uh, FSGS is not a disease. It's a diagnosis on biopsy. But it has become synonymous with a disease called focal sclerosis. And that's hard for us to keep in our minds as physicians. It, it, is a, it is the feature of many different diseases, but it in itself has now become a disease. And we're trying to understand what is the real FSGS, because that's going to be a separate disease with, a separate, with its own causes and so on. And, uh, as um, Dr. Connolly has stressed, there are many causes of the nephrotic syndrome, and the nephrotic syndrome itself is not a disease, but it's a collection of these features. And not all of these features are present in each patient with nephrotic syndrome, and not all of these features are present equally in each patient with nephrotic syndrome. Patients can vary from one to another. And of course, there are many causes of nephrotic syndrome, of focal sclerosis. Thankfully, minimal change nephrotic syndrome is probably the rarest of these causes. A very small percentage of patients will ever progress from minimal change nephrotic syndrome to focal sclerosis. And the, the largest number of patients have no known cause. And depending on the population, and Dr. Holtzman will talk about that, inherited causes have a higher frequency in different populations. 